Welcome. Our webinar today is organized by ECNP Preclinical Data Forum Network and hosted by Cohen's Veterans Bioscience. The topic of our webinar today is GRADE for Preclinical Animal Studies, Translating Evidence from Bench to Bedside. The GRADE stands for the Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. Our speaker today, Dr. Hoymans, will present the first draft of the GRADE approach for assessing the certainty in the evidence tailored to preclinical animal intervention studies in the context of therapeutic intervention, and she will also discuss some methodologic changes. Dr. Carlene Hoymans is assistant professor at the Department of Health Evidence Uses Unit, CIRCLE, and Department of Anesthesiology at the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Dr. Hoymans. Good afternoon, everybody, although uh, I understand that it's not afternoon for all of you. Uh, so I'm Carlijn Hoymans, and I work for the unit CIRCLE. And uh, CIRCLE is the Systematic Review Center for Laboratory Animal Experimentation. Here you can see our permanent staff members, and I am the one on the right part of the picture in the red sweater. I first want to tell you a little bit about our vision and our mission. Our vision, or the vision of CIRCLE, is a world in which any animal-based research conducted is justified, rigorous, and of high translational value. Our mission is to develop, apply, and disseminate systematic review and meta-analysis of animal studies as methodology to contribute to responsible animal-based research. Today, I will tell you a bit more about GRADE for Animal Studies. The GRADE approach can help you to structure and interpret the results of a systematic review and evaluate the potential clinical and just general benefits. But in order to understand how GRADE works, it's important that we all know what a systematic review and meta-analysis is and what the advantages are of the, for the preclinical field. So first, a systematic review. A systematic review is a process of systematically locating, appraising and synthesizing evidence from scientific studies in order to obtain a reliable overview. It is important to note that we search for all available published evidence. A meta-analysis can be part of a systematic review and it's a combination of the results of individual studies in an overall statistical analysis. So once again, it's important that you understand that meta-analysis can be a part of a systematic review, but it is not necessary. You will only combine the data if this is sensible, uh, so studies are homogeneous enough, for example. Systematic reviews of preclinical animal studies are relatively novel. So far, there are generally uh, two groups which are specifically focusing on this topic. This is CIRCLE, our center, and CAMARADES and published guidance on how to conduct systematic reviews of animal studies is emerging. I will now show you a short video that is part of our uh, e-learning. Although controversial, animal studies are still an essential step in the development of therapies and drugs for humans. This is based on our belief that the treatment efficacy and safety found in animals will translate to the patients we intend to cure. But what if translation fails and the promising results obtained in animal studies fail to translate to patients? Despite successful preclinical testing, up to 85% of early clinical trials for novel drugs fail. When animal studies do not predict the response in patients, laboratory animals may have been used ineffectively or unnecessarily, and patient safety may be at stake. Ethically, as well as economically, such research waste is unacceptable. So what determines the translational value of an animal study? Which factors influence treatment efficacy in animal studies? A thorough assessment of the available preclinical evidence may provide vital information to optimize future research and improve translation from animals to patients. But with hundreds of new animal studies published every day, it seems impossible to read up on all the literature. We urgently need methods to obtain a structured overview and systematic reviews are up for the job. A systematic review is a literature review focused on a single specific question, such as 
does fish oil improve memory in animal models of Alzheimer's disease? It aims to identify all available studies related to this question and to assess the quality of the evidence presented. It can synthesize new high-quality evidence from existing data. In fact, systematic reviews are regularly used in evidence-based medicine, where they are regarded as the highest level of evidence. But this methodology is not yet common practice for animal studies. A systematic review of animal studies is comprised of six main steps. Phrase the preclinical research question. Search for all evidence related to this question. Select the relevant animal studies and extract study characteristics. Assess the study quality and summarize the evidence. If possible, perform a meta-analysis, a statistical method to synthesize new evidence from existing data. At the top of these steps, interpret your results and enjoy the overview. So remember, systematic reviews of animal studies provide an overview of all available evidence on a specific topic and can point out knowledge gaps. The quality of the available evidence is appraised critically. Using meta-analysis, we can identify study characteristics which influence treatment efficacy. Their outcome can be used to inform the experimental design of future animal and clinical studies and can help you choose the best animal model for your study. Systematic reviews can provide valuable insights into the causes of translational failure, so future research may be set up for success. Feeling inspired? Click the blue button to continue, or visit www.circle.nl for more information, courses and training. Yes, so this is the end of the video and of course you can't start uh, push the blue button because this was just an intro of our e-learning. So I hope that the needs and steps of a systematic review are uh, now clear to everybody. And uh, before we can really talk a little bit more about grades, I also need, need to make sure that we all know now how to read a forest plot. Uh, and I will practice that for a minute. So here you can see 11 independent comparisons coming from five different studies, all studying the effect of metformin on infarct size. You can see here the individual comparisons. You can see the raw data from these experiments, and in this case this is the mean, the standard deviation and the n from both the experimental and the control group. In the next two columns you can see the weight of each individual study, and the actual effect size of each individual experiment. The weight is largely based on the precision of each study, and, and the effect size in this case is the difference between the mean of the experimental group minus the mean of the control group. Subsequently, we can plot these data in a graph, and the size of the green, squ the, the green square represents the weight of each individual study, so the larger the square, the more weight each study receives in the meta-analysis. The location of the square, so either on the left side or the right side, that represents the actual effect size, and the lines, the 95% confidence interval of the actual effect sizes of the individual studies. Subsequently, we can summarize all the results uh, of the individual study. So now we're conducting a meta-analysis, and we can calculate the overall effect size. So that's the black, black diamond you can see here. The width of the diamond represents the 95% confidence interval of the summary effect. Last but not least, we can also see estimations about the heterogeneity. So for example, below here you can see an I squared of 89%, and I will later on explain you what that means. And we see other estimations for heterogeneity like the tau and the degrees of freedom, etc. So, in the end, we can say now that, uh, based on what we can see in this graph, that metformin uh, significantly decreases infarct sizes in this case. Uh, why can I say significantly? Because the zero effect line in the graph is not included in the 95% confidence interval. But how do we really interpret the results of this forest plot? 
what do you need to take into account to decide whether or not you are confident in the results and whether metformin re really reduces infarct size. So some of us would consider the number of studies or the number of patients. Others would mainly focus on the heterogeneity levels between the studies and they look in the plot and look uh, at overlap between confidence intervals of the different studies. Or they look at the, the actual effect size of the summary effect and its precision. And some of us would not include all of these factors or forget a few of those factors. So this is where GRADE comes in. Originally, uh, GRADE is developed as a method of grading the quality of the evidence and the strength of the recommendations in guidelines or healthcare recommendations. The Cochrane collaboration adopted GRADE approach as a system to evaluate the overall quality of the body of evidence from a systematic review and to produce a summary of findings tables to present the evidence transparently to decision makers. Systematic reviewers should use GRADE to move from the results of the systematic review to conclusions and present the evidence, so make conclusions and decisions transparent. The GRADE approach considers all factors to determine how confident we are in the results and what the factors exactly are will I discuss in a few moments. It also assesses the strength of the evidence per outcome as the strength of the evidence can differ per outcome. So for example, for outcome A you can have 15 studies and outcome B has only 5 studies. And of course, it also take into, takes into account the magnitude of the effect, so the actual effect size. The GRADE approach ensures that the process of assessing the certainty in the evidence is systematic and that reasons for judgments are provided and transparent. So the certainty or the quality of the evidence can be graded in various categories, high, moderate, uh, low or very low. You can see that here on the right side. RCTs start as high quality in the original clinical uh, grade framework. And observational studies, they start as low quality evidence. There are five factors that can reduce the quality or the certainty in the evidence. So for example, risk of bias, inconsistency in the results, indirectness, imprecision, and publication bias. There are three factors in this approach that can upgrade uh, the quality or the level of evidence. And finally, if you take them all into account, you'll end up with a grade of the total body of evidence. So once again, we look at the body of evidence, not at individual studies anymore. The results of grade can subsequently be integrated in a summary of findings table. Such a table contains a list of all important outcomes, so here uh, the blood pressure, the heart rate, pulse pressure, etc., and uh, considers both a desirable and undesirable outcomes, so efficacy and harms. It also shows a typical burden of these outcomes, so effect sizes, the number of participants and studies addressing these outcomes, and the score, of course, of the overall certainty in the body of evidence. And important in GRADE is that everything is transparent, so, also, so our reasoning um, needs to be transparent so there's space for comments and footnotes, and that is really an important part of the summary of findings table. But how do we assess the factors that determine our certainty in the evidence? So let's start with risk of bias. When we are talking about risk of bias, we are talking about limitations in the execution and design of studies that causes systematic differences between experimental and control groups that are not due to the effect of the intervention. So in other words, bias uh, are systematic errors unintentionally made by the researchers. This bias can cause overestimations or underestimations of the true intervention effect. So for example, not randomizing the allocation of the participants to study groups may cause differences between the groups at the start of the study, not caused by the intervention. And here you can see two examples of the effect of low methodological quality on the effect of the study results. Not randomizing in the left plot and not blinding the outcome assessments overestimates the effect in a systematic review or meta-analysis. Thus, the conclusion of a systematic review critically depends on the quality of the included studies. Fortunately, there are tools available to assess the risk of bias in the individual studies. I will not go into detail on all the tools you can see here, 
But with regard to the animal studies, I would like to point out that the risk of bias II for animal studies is uh, quite recently uh, published, and uh, it's based on the Cochrane collaboration tool. However, for GRADE, we do not assess the risk of bias of the individual studies, but we assess the risk of bias of the total body of evidence, since in a systematic review we try to interpret the results of our body of evidence, so the summary of the evidence. We determine how serious the risk of bias might influence the body of the evidence. Here you can see the results of a risk of bias analysis, and we now need to decide as graders how serious the risk of bias is for the body of evidence. Important to note is that this depends on the outcome. So not lining the outcome uh, as depicted in this figure, because you can see that um, here the an complete row is almost, except for one uh, dot, red. So there's a high risk of bias for uh, blinding. But that th if this is risky or not depends on the outcome. So if it's about um, uh, mortality, um, then this is not really risky because that is really that. But if we, ha we assess a histological outcome in animal studies, for example, not blinding the outcome might be very serious risk of bias. So again, um, assessing whether or not risk of bias is serious depends on the research question. A second factor that needs to be interpreted is the consistency in the results. In other words, how heterogeneous is the evidence? There are different forms of heterogeneity. Clinical heterogeneity, and that is variation due to differences in design of the study. So, for example, different subsets of patients included in the various studies or differences in the intervention. So think of dosage, uh, differences in dosages, differences in timing, type of drugs used, etc. We also have methodological heterogeneity. So that is variation in the results due to differences in methodological quality. So for example, differences in the results due to risk of bias. And there are, of course, differences in the results due to multiple other factors. In GRADE, we try to assess the unexplained uh, heterogeneity. And our confidence in the results lower when there is unexplained heterogeneity. So when there is large variation in the effect sizes, or the confidence intervals in the forest plots do not overlap between the different studies. We also have a clue of large heterogeneity levels if the numbers, which I showed you before, below in the graph, are very high. So uh, high I squared means, for example, if you have an I squared of 90%, this means that 90% of the total amount of variation is due to real differences between studies. So again here, also for this factor, we try to judge if the inconsistency what we see really reduces our confidence in the results in relation to our conclusion. So here I try to explain inconsistency a little bit more with a figure. You can see here a figure with four individual studies. There appears to be variability. So if this is problematic and if this influences the certainty in our results depends on the research question. So if, for example, the question is whether treatment X is beneficial or harmful, there is no reason for concern regarding heterogeneity as all studies show the same direction of effect. So they, all those studies have the same conclusion. However, when the question is, for example, related to the level of effects, the heterogeneity is problematic, because we now we can't estimate the exact effect size. Is the exact or the real effect, is it close to the upper subgroup or closer to the lower subgroup of studies? So in this case, uh, I would downgrade for inconsistency if we, have an, if we are dealing with a question about a level of effect in this case. The next factor is about um, imprecision. So results are precise or imprecise when they are based on relatively few animals or humans and few events. So leading to wide confidence intervals, so these the wide lines around our effect sizes. So results are precise when we have enough animals, enough power, and the confidence interval excludes, for example, no effect. When the confidence interval overlaps with an effect, but the with no effect line, but the confidence interval is narrow, then it's still not a problem, and the results are still uh, precise. I can show you that here also a little bit in this uh, graph. Here you can see uh, six different studies. Uh, which should be diamonds, because when we look at precision, we try to interpret the diamond, so the summary effect. Um, but what you can see here is six, uh, six summary effects, and the first three are precise, 
and the, the letter three are imprecise. And I hope we all now understand why there is a difference, because we have a green study or a green uh, summary effect which has a very large confidence interval. But because this confidence interval um, um, is always on the uh, left side of the relevancy line, we do not doubt whether or not the treatment works. So although there is a wide confidence interval, it's still precise. So you can also have imprecise studies which have a small confidence interval. So the second red um, uh, summary effect is quite small, but because the confidence interval includes relevant and not relevant effect, we're not sure and the result is imprecise. So if we need to conclude if treatment works, we're not sure. The fourth factor is about publication bias. The reliability of the results can be diminished by uh, unpublished parts of studies. So often small negative studies are not published. And not publishing these studies can result in an overestimation of the effect in a meta-analysis. So in order to check whether publication bias could play a role in a systematic review, we can create a funnel plot. Here you see uh, a, a funnel plot and each black dot represents an individual study. And on the x-axis you see the actual effect size and on the y-axis a measure of the precision. So when a confidence interval is large, a study is imprecise and the dot appears low in the graph. Normally, all the dots should be distributed in a funnel around the overall effect size and this line in the middle is the overall effect size. Deviation from the shape can indicate publication bias. So in order to estimate the amount of publication bias, we can impute the possible uh, missing studies. In this case, you can see that especially small studies with a negative effect are missing. Small studies because they are low in the graph, so they probably are not that precise and often the smaller studies are not precise. And a negative effect because they are on the left side of the graph. And what we can see is that if we impute those possible missing studies, those, this, those studies which, which ended up in the file drawers, we have an overestimation of the actual effect size. However, if publication bias influences our confidence in the evidence, depends again on the research question. In, for the level of evidence, it is not that worrying here because the effect is still significant and still large. It goes from 20% to 40%. Um, so there is not a big problem. Finally, we have indirectness as a factor. Especially in animal studies, this is a very important factor. But I will come back to that. But direct evidence is research that directly compares the intervention in which we are interested, in the population in which we are interested, and it measures outcomes important to the population in which we are interested. It sounds obvious, but often we have to deal with, in a way, uh, indirect results. And again, we determine if the presence of indirectness influences the reliability of the body of evidence. So I will show you two examples. First one for indirectness for human studies and then one for animal studies. So the first one in humans. The World Health Organization uh, needed to develop advice about the effect of ozotomavir for prophylaxis of avian flu. However, the available evidence showed only randomized trials of ozotomavir for seasonal influenza and not for avian flu. So as the panel judged that the biology of seasonal influenza was sufficiently different from that of avian influenza, it was concluded that the evidence needed to be downgraded for indirectness. The second example for indirectness in animal studies is in a review about the effects of probiotic supplementation in animal models for acute pancreatitis. The available animal evidence showed that many of the studies used models for multi-organ failure instead of acute pancreatitis. And of course, multi-organ failure is a, is a consequence of, could be a consequence of acute pancreatitis, but it's not uh, exactly acute pancreatitis or uh, the best model we could choose. Although a lot of the evidence was included about multi-organ failure in these reviews, we had a kind of indirect evidence as well but there was not much better available. As I mentioned before, there are also factors that can upgrade the quality or the certainty in the body of evidence. So a reminder, upgrading is only possible for studies that started as low quality evidence. So for example, the observational studies. So the certainty in the evidence may increase when there is a clear dose-response relationship. 
a dose-response relationship is seen as an important criteria for believing a putative cause-effect relationship. The second upgrading factor is when observing very large effects in well-conducted observational studies. And finally, residual confounding and bias. Occasionally, confounding can increase our confidence in the evidence. In case all remaining residual confounding in an observational study, um, so confounding that was not accounted for uh, underestimates the real effect, but uh, sometimes if this is the case, so uh, may I, say, I should say, uh, phrase it a little bit different. Um, so if the remaining residual confounding underestimates the real effect, the presence of this confounding may strengthen the conclusion. As for all other factors, it's also here that, uh, important to determine if the presence of these upgrading factors influence the reliability of our conclusions. Now we assessed all factors for human grade, and now we can finally create our evidence profile. Here you can see an example for an evidence profile of randomized clinical trials. The quality of all factors is graded per outcome. You can see each outcome listed here, and per factor. So here you see the, the risk of bias, the inconsistency, etc. And ultimately, an overall quality rating is provided. So now we know how GRADE works, but why is it also important for animal studies, and what are the differences? First, I'd like to focus on why. As is in the clinical situation, systematic reviewers of animal studies should use GRADE to move from the results of a systematic review to make conclusions and present the evidence. So in order to evaluate the potential clinical benefits of animal research, um, if that's reliable, or to decide whether or not starting a new animal experiment contributes to the existing evidence base. It's assumed that a higher certainty in the evidence would be related to higher translation success rates. But how are we going to do that? Therefore, we developed a first concept for a grade for preclinical animal intervention studies. We focused on preclinical animal intervention studies in the context of therapeutic interventions in which the investigator controls the intervention. These studies are typically used to uh, test the efficacy and safety of medical interventions, for example, in the preclinical phase of the development of a new drug, or to better understand disease or intervention mechanism or the action of the intervention. Our framework or our approach consists out of six steps, and I will shortly discuss these steps with you. Step one. The first step is, of course, framing the rationale of the clinical question. In the proposed approach, the overall goal is to answer a clinical question. So the first step is to specify the healthcare-related question using the PICO, Patient Intervention Comparison Outcome Methodology. The second step is to um, scope the literature to assess the clinical evidence. When there is very limited evidence from, for example, human studies, you might want to use preclinical animal evidence. Reasons for synthesizing animal evidence include the intervention still being in development, never tested in humans, for example, or clinical experiments are uh, unethical, for example, because of the nature of the intervention or the nature of the outcomes and the absence of observational studies, for example. Or when there's very low quality human evidence, considering evidence from animal studies might change the assessment of likely magnitude of an effect or might potentially increase our certainty in the evidence. The third step is to formulate the preclinical PICO. As the clinical question is leading, the preclinical question should be derived from the clinical PICO, so the clinical question. A separate preclinical PICO is needed to define the eligibility criteria for the systematic review of animal studies. And it also serves as a first outline of aspects of indirectness. So differences between the preclinical and the clinical PICO will relate to indirectness, of course. In step four, we collect preclinical evidence and we summarize the effect estimates by, out by outcome. The optimal application of GRADE requires an up-to-date and well-conducted systematic review. And the eligibility criteria follow from this preclinical PICO question. And all evidence needs to be summarized in an evidence profile. In step five, we assess and rate the quality of the animal research evidence by outcome. So in our approach, 
animal experiment starts all as high quality evidence and inadequate or lack of randomization is part of the risk of bias assessment. So, in rating the certainty of the evidence, we propose to assess first, by outcome, the grade down grading factors, risk of bias, imprecision, inconsistency, and publication bias, subsequently followed by two layers of indirectness, and in the end, we consider whether or not we still could upgrade. So, step 5a, we assess the risk of bias, the inconsistency, imprecision, and publication bias. Risk of bias, we discussed uh, a few minutes ago uh, quite extensively, so I do not need to give uh, this some more uh, attention, I think, in this case, but you can use tools, and if they are available, I recommend to use those tools. Inconsistency. So briefly, when we were talking about inconsistency or heterogeneity, uh, we assess uh, the overlap between confidence intervals and the magnitude and direction of the effects of the individual studies and, of course, the statistical heterogeneity in numbers such as the I-squared levels. Heterogeneity in animal research can be expected, of course, as a result from the often explorative review design. So, in other words, uh, part of the heterogeneity is intentionally induced and should not be part of the certainty of evidence grading. The issue is more how to separate intentional and unexplained heterogeneity and how to interpret an I-squared levels. Further, we identified two levels of inconsistency in animal studies. Inconsistency within species and inconsistency across species. If you look, for example, at the figure below, you can see quite heterogeneous results. Why do I say heterogeneous? Because often the confidence intervals do not overlap. However, um, when you know or see that we have various species or various animal models, I think we should accept a certain level of inconsistency between species when direction of effects do not differ between species. And in this case, for example, in both the rabbits, the mice, the rats, and the pigs, the direction of the effect is still the same. Imprecision. We now know that the results are imprecise when based on relatively few patients or animals and few events, which leads to wide confidence interval around the summary uh, effect, so the black diamond. And grades suggest rating down if the optimal information size, which is in a way a sample size for systematic reviews, is not met. Or if the optimal information size is met, but the confidence interv uh, interval overlaps with uh, no effect. This implies setting thresholds for clinical uh, relevant differences. The most important issue so far for animal studies is how to calculate the optimal information size. In animal intervention studies, for example, the experimental unit can be the cage because often the animals are not individually housed but group-wise housed. And another um, difficult is how to set thresholds for clinical relevance. Then regarding publication bias, um, publication bias is a systematic underestimation or overestimation of the underlying beneficial or harmful effect due to selective publication of results. And this appears to be very important for animal studies as well. I think that many of us who conducted animal studies before have a few experiments which ended up in the file drawer or in the drawer and were not published. Assessment of publication bias in animal studies can be very challenging sometimes, as currently no formal registration of plant animal studies is publicly available, and the number of studies is often small. So, estimating the risk of publication bias can be uncertain. Indirectness. Assess indirectness. Direct evidence comes from research that directly compares the intervention in which we are interested when applied to the population in which we are interested and measures outcomes important to patients. We propose for animal studies to assess indirectness in two layers. The first layer considers indirectness from preclinical animal studies to the preclinical animal PICO, so the preclinical animal evidence to the preclinical question, is there indirectness between those two? And the second layer considers indirection from the preclinical evidence to the clinical question. So this second uh, level is more about in the translatability uh, in a way. To explain the two levels of indirectness a little bit more, I'll give you again a few examples. Here you can see, for example, again the same uh, example about probiotic supplementation in animal models for acute pancreatitis. 
So in level one, if we look at evidence from preclinical animal studies and compare that with our preclinical research question, um, we can have indirectness because in some study models for multi-organ failure were used instead of acute pancreatitis. So this is exactly the example I gave before. But when we're talking about the second level, about translatability, we look at, again, back at the evidence we have in our systematic review and we compare it with our clinical question. So for example, in this review, uh, histological damage was determined in the animal studies as a surrogate outcome for functional loss in patients. And of course, histological damage does not always mean or indicate functional loss. So in that way, there is a kind of indirectness in the outcome. Another example here was that the timing of the intervention in animal studies, so the timing when probiotics were supplemented, was often before inducing acute pancreatitis, whereas patients which have these pro received probiotics, they receive it after disease appeared. So again, this can be very serious indirectness. Finally, we need to assess whether upgrading is needed. Although most preclinical animal studies are experiments and they start as high quality of the evidence, upgrading may still be relevant. For example, upgrading could be relevant when the results between various species are consistent. So what we saw in the figure I showed before, when you have the rabbits, the dogs, the pigs, etc., and they all show the same direction of effect. It is, however, for us still unclear if inconsistency across species should be seen as an, uh, or consistency across species should be seen as an upgrading factor or as a component of indirectness or translatability. So this is the last step in rating the certainty um, in the evidence in order to finally rate um, the certainty in the evidence, so high, moderate, low, or very low, and all great factors need to be considered simultaneously. The biggest challenge herein is that it's not yet completely clear how to weigh the various factors. So for example, how much should indirectness weigh in the overall rating? And in, because indirectness might be a little bit more important in animal studies um, compared to human studies. So I showed you a few uh, uncertainties and challenges, but what is important to know is that this does not mean that, you, that we can't use GRADE, because we still have the same factors as in the clinical situation, um, and we can all apply them when we have a systematic review result. However, the GRADE systematics for animal studies need to be developed in the uh, coming years, but as this was done for human GRADE, uh, this takes years and years, and still for human grade, every few months there's a small update, and this will probably happen for animal grade as well. Anyway, this was briefly an introduction on how grade works, and what is out there for assessing the certainty in the evidence of preclinical animal studies. The main take-home message from this presentation is, in my opinion, grade aims to structure and interpret the results of a systematic review and reliably evaluates the potential benefit and harms of a treatment. GRADE needs to and can be applied to preclinical animal studies in the context of therapeutic interventions. Further methodological work is needed, as I just mentioned, but nevertheless the generic GRADE approach appeared applicable and the presented preclinical animal GRADE framework already provides the much needed guidance to improve interpreting the results of systematic reviews of animal studies and to rate the certainty in the body of evidence. Last but not least, grading the evidence will not only help researchers, us who conduct systematic reviews for example, but also potential funders of clinical or animal research and ethical committees, and thereby reduces the risk of misinforming future human studies. So thank you for your attention, and I wonder if there are any questions. Thank you, Dr. Huymans. I'm not seeing any questions at this point, so I just want to thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And if we do get any questions subsequently, I will email them to you. Yes, you're more than welcome. Thank you.